There we go. Hey, Shireen, I just saw you joined. And welcome everybody, slowly but surely. You'll see, hopefully everybody sees in the background, there is a presentation. Um, this is just gonna filter through some photos and we're gonna give it a few minutes as folks join. It'd be interesting to see some of these people in the in real life. In years past, we saw them all in training, but we did so much virtual stuff this year. So while we're waiting, um, I'll introduce myself. I'm Skip Stiles, um, Executive Director of Wetlands Watch. And uh, let me, let me give you, um, oh, somebody's, somebody's not on mute. <laughs> so if you could, if you could, if you could mute when you're not talking, unless you're, you want your dog uh, to be part of the webinar. Um, so, um, as I said, I'm Skip Stiles with Wetlands Watch, and um, the phone app was, grew out of some work that we were doing with local governments back in yes, 2013, I guess it was, and um, we found that a lot of locat well, all, at that point, nearly all of the localities were hurting for information about where it actually flooded. Um, they knew, okay, that intersection floods, but they didn't know where all the intersections were, all the street segments were. Um, they didn't know the extent of the impact. And so in 2014, we got a small grant and um, tried to see if we could develop a phone app that would allow citizen scientists to actually go out and collect real-time information about where the flooding was occurring in ways that um, local governments, emergency planners, transportation planners, all the people who were, who at that time were just scratching their heads about what seemed to be increased flooding and sea level rise so that they could do some planning. And so um, we got, like I said, we got a small grant. We found a, an a IT company here in Norfolk, Concursive, and um, put together the app and was sort of, beta testing it, we used it up and down the East Coast from Florida to Maine, or well, Cape Cod uh, during Hurricane Joaquin. And we're basically just punking along, trying to find uses, applications, interest in it. And then um, Dave Mayfield, who's also on this call, um, who at that time was the uh, environmental reporter for the Virginian pilot, came up with this brilliant idea of trying to get um, a bunch of people out on the projected highest tide of the year um, to do uh, mapping um, and uh, sort of turn it into a, an event. And, and um, Dave still has, has plans for a much larger, a much larger event um, than we have now. But he got uh, the Virginian pilot and then the daily press and then WHRO, and then uh, all of the local TV media outlets um, to, to push this um, Catch the King event, Catch the King Tide. And so in 2017, uh, oh, and, he, and then he uh, brought Derek and the BIMS folks in because um, he had been, I guess, you can correct me about the, the path on this, Dave, but he knew that um, that VIMS was doing this really cool uh, flood modeling. And so um, Derek and, um, and later Karen came into the, the core group as well. And um, we were off to the races and in 2017, we kicked the thing off. Uh, it was at that time, mostly this part of Hampton Roads because that's where the most activity was and where we had uh, the trainings and the rest. And that was the year that we had um, 
How many did we kick out that year, Derek? 700 and some mappers, wasn't it? Yeah, we had uh, 718 officially through the app. Then we had two other ways that people could upload data as well, like through a uh, US. Uh, I guess we had a couple of different um, crowdsourcing maps through ArcGIS Online as well that people used. The uh, Guinness World Records was able to count all of those as GPS high water marks, but about 88% of our data came from the Sea Level Rise app that yeah. year. Well, and then, and then uh, we were just floored by the numbers of people who showed up and the amount of data that was collected. So, so Derek went and piled that up and found, <laughs> found some odd category <laughs> in the Guinness record book. And sure enough, um, we got the Guinness in the Guinness record book for what was the category, Derek? What did you, what category did you find? Uh, we are the world's largest environmental survey. Uh, it's measured in terms of people and the period of time. So we collected, I think, nearly 60,000 GPS high water marks in a six hour period of time. Yeah. So um, that was the start of it. And then uh, we brought eight WHRO in as a, um, a, a sort of a deeper partner. And in um, subsequent years, they kicked in with another uh, program they developed, um, standards of learning compliant high school environmental curriculum that was a, that worked around the, uh, the app. And then um, they got some foundation funding to basically run a, a contest where they were awarding um, cash prizes to um, high schools that participated in that, um, high school curriculum and collected data. So we began to, through WHRO, we began to expand this into the high schools and we actually have plans to go back out and, and do more of that. Um, they've updated the, uh, the SOL standards for the um, environmental education piece of this. And then um, Dave, some, Dave Mayfield somehow ran into the Girl Scouts and mm -hmm. uh, the Girl Scouts, um, have become part of our uh, group as well. They're, um, we've met with them a couple times. Uh, Dave, like I said, got us hooked up with them. They're very interested in making this part of their citizen science badge for the Girl Scouts. And there have been a number of Girl Scouts participating over the last couple of years. We're, um, we're looking at trying to expand it farther within the, um, the Colonial Coast Council of the, of the Girl Scouts, which runs from Gloucester to Ocracoke and basically from the coast over to the fall line, over to 95. And they're at pre-COVID, there were 10,000 scouts, Girl Scouts and, and uh, guardians, adult guardians and, and parents involved. So we're sort of on the cusp of expanding into that realm. Um, and then we've, we've established partnerships with a whole bunch of, of other folks. Um, with, with Karen's help, we've hooked up with a master naturalist and are looking to expand that relationship as well. So, the whole the whole catch the king effort has uh, has been moving along um, quite well. And and this year we finally came out of the COVID doldrums, and so we're looking to to expand it uh, even farther. And the biggest gain of all, and at this point um, I will hand it off, has been to hire a full time. Um, coordinator outreach person um, who most of you probably dealt with um, uh, Gabby Kinney um, who was uh, who came to us uh, early last year so um, Gabby will be the, the the master of ceremonies here and before we go much farther I do have to recognize the people who've helped us um, over the years right we got uh, some tremendous support from the environmental defense fund that allowed us both to to hire Gabby and also to uh, update the app, a, a process that's uh, still in, or a, pro, a, a piece of progress that's still in process. Um, in years past, we've gotten strong support from Hampton Road Sanitation District um, and also with uh, from um, AECOM, which is a contractor for HRSD. So, um, and then oh, we also received some funding from Rutgers uh, at one point to update the app, the Jacques Cousteau. National Estuarine Research Center at Rutgers provided some funding. So with that, I think I'll turn it over to Gabby and um, I guess that's what I'm supposed to do and have her take it from here. 
Absolutely. Yeah, we were. Um, hey, everybody. First of all, my name is Gabby. Skip gave me a pretty good intro. Um, I am the newest member of uh, Wetlands Watch, and I am their outreach manager. So I work um, a lot with the Sea Level Rise app, helping coordinate volunteers and hopefully take the app to new heights. Um, Skip mentioned our partnership with the Girl Scouts through Dave Mayfield and perhaps making this event much larger than it has been in the past. Um, so hi, everybody. Thanks to everyone for being here and everybody who participated. I really appreciate um, so many people on the call. First of all, that's wonderful. Um, and I believe the next thing on our agenda was just to run through some introductions. So that's me. I'm Gabby. And I'll go ahead and pass it along to Dave Mayfield. Thank you, Gabby. Uh, I am Dave Mayfield, a retired environmental reporter for the Virginian Pilot. Uh, I had the good fortune of uh, having as among my best sources uh, during the time that I was at the Pilot, uh, Skip Styles and Derek Loftus. Uh, every time I thought about something related to sea level rise, those are the two guys I thought of uh, first uh, when I needed to get some information quick. And uh, they were also the first two folks that I turned to uh, when I came up with this crazy idea of uh, getting lots of folks together on one day, potentially to uh, use this app that I was aware of to go out and measure the tides. And it was just a, a wonderful confluence of events uh, and enthusiasms. And just need to make a quick shout out to a couple of people from the pilot who, with whom this never would have been possible. Steve Gunn, former editor at the pilot, uh, and uh, Sam Hunley, who created that wonderful logo. Uh, he's an artist who, uh, I think it just has immense talent, and uh, I think it really helped uh, give the the pro the uh, project a lift that uh, we really needed. And uh, so, anyways, uh, it's just been so wonderful to see so many people come together. I think we're north of fifteen hundred folks now who've uh, at some time over the last uh, six years uh, have gone out and measured, and uh, uh, you know, it's just so gratifying to to see uh, the enthusiasm that, uh, that you all have shown for the event. So thank you very much. And I don't know who we turn to, turn to next. <laughs> Karen, you can go ahead. Okay. Hi everyone. My name is Karen During. I'm a coastal scientist at the Virginia Institute of Marine Science or VIMS. I've been a Catch the King training instructor and tide captain for the past five years, working with Skip and Dave and Derek and others, mostly um, supporting Northern Neck and Middle Peninsula teams to expand the geographic coverage of the, the mapping beyond the Hampton Roads, Norfolk area. Thank you so much for all of you being here tonight to be part of this community science project and to allow us an opportunity to express our appreciation for your involvement. And next, I'll turn it over to Derek. Thank you, Karen. I'm uh, Derek Loftus. I'm a research professor at uh, the Virginia Institute of Marine Science within their Center for Coastal Resources Management. And I work with Karen along with many others uh, in the center there to help develop hydrodynamic models that help us predict flooding in different places. So when Dave Mayfield first reached out to me um, and came up with this idea with the support of his uh, managing editor, Steve Gunn, over at the Virginian Pilot back in 2017, we were really thrilled about the opportunity to be able to not just produce these forecasts, but actually have a way to have them validated. You know, Skip was kind enough to share with me back in 2014 some of the work that he had been developing with the uh, inaugural version of the Sea Level Rise app, you know, back in Hurricane Arthur that happened uh, nearly a decade ago now, uh, testing that in the Hague of Norfolk. And, you know, it's really cool to see that you can get a handful of people in neighborhoods that heuristically have a lot of background understanding of where flooding happens. But to be able to see that on a map and kind of cross-reference which areas that our model needs some improvements and in other places where maybe cities have started to do some storm drainage mitigation efforts to try and you know, increase our subsurface storage facilities and capabilities to you know, displace this water somewhere else. Uh, those types of things are interesting for us to try and make the model match realities as best as possible. And so your continued data collection through the Sea Level Rise app developed by Wetlands Watch really helps us in a lot of different ways. So thank you for helping make this, I guess, sixth year of Catch the King since 2017 become so successful.
Thanks, Derek. Um, we can pass it over to Margie, Dr. Margaret Maholland. Unmute and show myself. <laughs> Hi, uh, I'm not doing my talk now, right? Just no, it just up. just an intro. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I've been a professor at ODU since 2020. I mean, 2000. Uh, an extra zero and less one two. And um, I've been in the ocean and earth sciences department. And when we started uh, beta testing the fo phone app with Skip and our kids we uh, noticed a lot of stuff in the water. So we developed a project to take advantage of Catch the King that would also measure water quality impacts from co coastal flooding. And we've been doing it since the inaugural Catch the King event in 2017. So really excited to be able to share some of these results. Um, they've actually, all these results have, have been put into a dissertation by Alfonso Macias Tapia, who's been a graduate student at ODU, a PhD student. He is now a Knauss Fellow up in NOAA in their education division. So um, really excited about that, that he's landed on his feet and gotten a job and his work is um, taking center stage in a lot of places. So thanks. Thank you, very exciting, that's awesome. Um, we had one more presenter, uh, Tom Allen from ODU. I'm just going to double check and make sure he's, see if he's on the call. I don't think I've seen him join yet, but we'll get started without him if, in case he's a face. Uh, yeah, I don't see his name. All right, well, hopefully he joins us later to present on Measure the Muck, um, but we'll turn it over to kind of the main appreciation slide show. So um, this is kind of the bulk and will be a, kind of a 30 minute section. We're going to try to um, get through it. You'll honestly hear me talk a lot. So um, hopefully I can make it interesting for you guys. Um, and on this first slide here, you'll notice we have a whole bunch of logos at the bottom. Skip's already mentioned quite a few of them, um, but I want to recognize them again. We have quite a few sponsors for Catch the King, um, the Environmental Defense Fund, AECOM, WHRO, and HRSD. And then of course, our lovely partners who have already introduced themselves from VIMS and ODU. Um, just a big old thank you to all of those groups for helping us coordinate, bring in volunteers and all of that good stuff. And Dave also mentioned this beautiful um, King Tide logo here on the right. Um, it's kind of become the face of Catch the King. So we're, we're lucky to have that graphic, which is pretty awesome. Um, so Karen is actually going to start with some special recognitions in the Northern Neck and Middle Peninsula area. They are our rock stars for Catch the King. And we'll go into a little bit more detail about those um, the results of that region a little bit later, but Karen had some special recognition um, for that area. So Karen, go ahead and take it away. Thanks, Gabby. Before I get into the mapper recognitions, I first want to um, acknowledge that all community science projects like this one must have a dedicated project coordinator. So the very first special recognition I want to give is for you, Gabby the new Wetlands Watch Outreach Manager and Catch the King Coordinator. Thank you so much for your willingness to hit the ground running, learn about past Catch the King events and keeping us organized as a, as a group. We really appreciate it. And I'm sure all of you will agree with me that we're very lucky to have Gabby's enthusiasm and pleasant demeanor uh, working for us um, and Catch the King. Thank so you, the, next, the next special recognition Tonight goes out to all the mappers who are Virginia Master Naturalists and Extension Master Gardeners. And they came from several coastal regions in coastal Virginia. These are all public service volunteers. They are positive, trusted influencers in their local communities. And so your participation and your unique position to share what you've learned through this project makes a big impact for this group, this whole effort. So you have a lot of choices for volunteering your time. And we are really appreciative that, and thank you for choosing Catch the King as a cause worth volunteering for. Next slide, please. Now we'd like to give special recognition to the Northern Neck and Middle Peninsula mappers. But first, a lot of people ask me, exactly where is that in Virginia? So here's a map. The Northern Neck is located between the Potomac and Rappahannock rivers with four major counties there. 
And the Middle Peninsula is located between the Rappahannock and the York Rivers. So just wanted to um, orient those of you who may not be as familiar with our part of coastal Virginia. Next slide. The Northern Neck Shoreline Evaluation Program is a group of master gardener volunteers who provide community education about many things, including shorelines and flooding. This group organized themselves into four mapping teams and even recruited and trained new mappers working through a very brand new process with the updated app. The four county team leaders deserve special recognition for their persistence to make their fourth Catch the King community science event better than before. And this includes Mary Turville, Ian Shin, Jeff Evans, and Carol Martin. Thank you all and all of your team members. Next slide. On the Middle Peninsula, mappers included volunteers from the Middle Peninsula Master Naturalists. And I'm the chapter advisor for this group. Susan Crockett and Rose Sullivan drove 65 miles to catch the king tide at four public landings. John Powell and Bill Blair were with me at VIMS. They successfully mapped the VIMS shorelines at our Gloucester Point campus while my phone just froze up. So I was lucky to have them there. Another master naturalist, Dave Harlan, mapped at the new state park for the first day and then drove 45 minutes away on day two to map his usual sites in Matthews County. Amy Baker is a new member to our mapping team. and She joined the Matthews mappers and along with veteran mapper and local high school teacher, Jody Rudder expanded coverage and data points in this part of the Middle Peninsula region. So I'd like to thank all of those mappers, but I really wanna put out a special round of thanks to all 29 mappers from the Northern Neck and Middle Peninsula for your participation. And now I'll turn it back over to Gabby. Thank you, Karen. And yes, thank you all so very much. Um, we had a lot of really great activity, a lot of new mappers this year. Um, I especially think it's great that so many people are willing to get their feet wet for the Commonwealth. Um, it's it's really awesome to see such a widespread citizen science mapping event. And I truly think it's only up from here. So um, thank you, Karen, for that, that special recognition. It's awesome. So to kick off this section, um, we're going to kind of go region by region. Um, we had CTK regions all across um, the Tidewater area and into the Northern Neck. Um, so we're going to go region by region and uh, recognize the top three mappers in each region. Um, the top two, and I'm explaining this now so I don't have to do it every slide. <laughs> the top two mappers will receive a Catch the King t-shirt. If anybody hasn't seen these yet, they're pretty awesome. They have a Catch the King logo on the front and some cool stuff on the back. Um, so every top two mapper will receive a t-shirt as well as some stickers. So if you do see your name um, in the top two on these slides, please feel free to, or please do email me um, with your t-shirt size and uh, the best way to get it to you. Um, I believe we could probably mail them or coordinate some sort of meetup um, so we can trade those off. So um, just a general thank you. And uh, my email will be at the end of the slide for anyone who did receive an award. So we'll start, um, Karen, Went over this a tiny bit, but our top mapping stats, stats, we had 131 participants overall. So that's pretty darn awesome, um, especially after COVID and all of that kind of gearing up new mapping teams um, was certainly proving difficult. And so to see so many people out there um, is really awesome. Almost 15,000 pins were dropped, geographical pins. And I'll talk a little bit more later on how you can view that data. And Derek will also go over um, some of that data analysis as well. Um, the average pin dropped per participant was 112. I think that's pretty awesome. That's a solid like half hour of mapping out there. So way to go, guys. Um, most pins drop. I wanted to highlight Marianne Keeley. 983 pins in Virginia Beach. This skyrockets the amount of pins of an individual. So Marianne, um, you will absolutely get a t-shirt and some stickers and we'll recognize you again a little bit later um, in the Virginia Beach region. So congratulations and thank you. Um, Karen also very um, generously uh, recognized the Northern Neck and the Middle Peninsula. And I want to thank Karen for her coordination efforts there too. She really um, put some teams together 
and helped coordinate those and made sure that we had their feedback um, on how the event went for them. So congratulations to the Northern Neck and Middle Peninsula for not only being the region with the most pins, but also the most participants, 29 people. Um, so thank you for all of those efforts up there. Um, and we can officially say that the king tide not only came, but it was caught. It's funny because I can't hear anybody laughing at that, but I'm gonna hope there was a couple chuckles in there. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll start with the uh, the Northern Neck. Um, again, 29 participants, um, 3,600 pins. Top mappers, Ian Shane, 376 pins. Joe Del Rudder, 320 pins. And John Powell, 316 pins. Um, and then each slide, I wanted to kind of take some screenshots from the Sea Level Rise app just to show some of the data that was collected um, and how you can view it. These are viewable through the app to anybody who's joined um, the particular event. So anybody who has access to a CTK region and the CTK 2022 um, event can see these mapping um, photos. I also wanted to pinpoint the quality of the data that was collected. So you can see how tight knit these pins are dropped. Um, we had some technological issues throughout the day and throughout the weekend, but we really got some really great high quality data collection, um, especially in the northern neck. So really great job there, guys. Next up is Norfolk, uh, 22 people, 2,275 pins, top mappers Robin Franklin, 252 pins, Eliza Lewis, 241 pins, and Betty Bauckham, 230. 13 pins. So thank you to you guys um, for those efforts. Those are some pretty high uh, pin dropping stats. So thanks for that. Um, we had some good quality mapping in The Hague, um, a couple other boat ramps, and Mayflower Road, which is notorious to be a high flooding spot. Um, and actually this year, what we've discovered with the app is that not only can we collect uh, the pin data, but we also have that GPS satellite photo of the street that now Mayflower shows cars driving through water. Skip, I saw you come off mute there for a second. Did you want to say something? I was going to say, this is one of those Google Earth things. The, the, the satellite came over and took a picture of Mayflower during one of its wet days. So the base map actually shows a car driving through the puddle that was mapped by the mapper the day of Catch the King. So it's, it's sort of validation of the app, I guess. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. So if anybody feels like exploring uh, their events a little bit more and you see some more of these screenshots, feel free to send them our way. Um, we think they're a pretty good example of, of, of how to um, map flooding in more ways than one. So um, in Virginia Beach, we had 17 participants, 2,274 pins. Marianne Keeley, 938 pins. Thank you again for that extensive effort. Um, Lynn Eklund, 573 pins, also awesome. And Suzanne Hellstorm, uh, 288 pins. Thank you guys so much. And you can see a good coverage and spread of pins on that map there. It's pretty awesome. And here's a couple photos. This stretch right here in the middle, amazing data set, um, super close, tight knit, looks awesome. And a couple more on the coast. Chesapeake, 12 participants, 1,700 pins. Trisha Sands, 246 pins. Laura May, 213 pins. And Bob Harkins, 143 pins. Thank you all so very much. Here's some of that data as well. One of the cool things too um, that seems to crop up this year is we got a little bit more mapping on private property areas, which is really great because we can't access that data um, and a lot of uh, researchers can't access that data on a regular basis. So one of the great things that the app serves is gathering that private property um, data. So it looks like quite a few folks did map their backyards, their neighborhoods. Um, so that data is so great. And if you know anybody who has regular flooding in their backyards, see if we can get them involved uh, with the app, it'd be awesome. York County and Pocosin, uh, 13 people participated, 1,000 pins. Richard Decker with 274 pins, Helen Drees with 264 pins, and Alan Sheeler with 179 pins. Thank you guys so much. A couple boat ramps there, good coastlines. Williamsburg and James City County, this is my neck of the woods. Uh, total participants, 13, 1,000 pins. Cheryl Liu, 326 pins. Frank Polster, who was a leader in the Williamsburg 
Pittsburgh area. Thank you so much, Frank, uh, for all of your coordination efforts. 171 pins and Judy Jones, 121 pins. Um, Williamsburg is notorious for the Colonial uh, Parkway, which has quite a bit of flooding. And Frank does a really great job getting some mapping teams to capture flooding on that Colonial Parkway. Um, you can see here there's Sandy Bay um, and they got a good couple spots on there. So great job with that. Hampton, we had five participants, 435 pins. Top mappers, Brian Barmore. Brian Barmore is also one of our tide captains and does some really awesome coordination um, and volunteer recruitment with the master naturalist over there. I always get confused between garden masters and naturalists and gardeners, but they're all absolutely amazing. I was also invited to a training with the master naturalists there. Um, so it was great to kind of interact with them. So thank you, Brian, for setting that up. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, and it was great to meet everybody. Um, and Christy Gardner with 21 pins. So thank you guys for mapping Hampton for us. It's awesome. And in Suffolk, oh no, this one wasn't formatted as well. <laughs> Suffolk, we had three participants, uh, 345 pins, Carla Bangs, 193 pins, and Arabella Noel with 65 pins. And I received an email this morning that Arabella may or may not be joining us on the call, but um, I'm excited to announce she is a Girl Scout and um, she is one of the top two mappers. So congratulations, Arabella. Um, you will also be getting a t-shirt and stickers um, as a young scout. So thanks for participating and uh, mapping out there. We really appreciate it. Newport News, we had three participants, 160 pins. Dave Mayfield, our very own with 86 pins. Um, I believe I got you a t-shirt already, but if you'd like another one, let me know. <laughs> Ryan McCulski, I hope I'm saying that correctly. McCluskey, 57 pins. I apologize if I um, ruined the name. And uh, Christy Gardner again with 16 pins. Um, I am thankful for everybody who mapped in Newport News. We only had three people out there and clearly they're all shown here, but um, it was really good coverage. Here's a couple of the data sets. Little coastlines here and there, trouble spots. Um, this is also actually probably a good time to mention trouble spots. If anybody's unfamiliar um, with the trouble spot function in the app, this is a really good example of a place that would be good to place a trouble spot pin. There's a function in the app um, where you don't have to do a full pin dropping of a coastline or an area that floods. You can just drop a single pin that notifies um, us of a regular uh, flooding spot. And so these kinds of places where there's just a little bit of shoreline that floods, this would be a good place to return to and map consistently over time and see how that spot um, gets worse over time with flooding or perhaps it gets better if a living shoreline is in, uh, installed. I know Frank Polster um, did something similar in Williamsburg and showed us how a living shoreline um, improved the flooding in, in an area in Williamsburg. So that was really great. Um, but yeah, trouble spots function. If you have any questions about it, feel free to email me. Um, it looks like my formatting didn't quite cross over on this. I apologize, guys. Um, outside of Hampton Roads, we had one participant, Miss Karen Wolf, with 637 pins. Um, I hope she's joining us today. I haven't checked to see if she is, but um, she is the sole mapper of Kipta Peak and Cape Charles um, out there in the Eastern Shore. Uh, so thank you so much, Karen, for being the sole mapper out there. Really awesome efforts and really great data collection. Um, really awesome set of GPS pins that I'm sure will be super beneficial to the data modeling. And the Measure the Muck team, this is Dr. Mulholland's team, um, did quite a few spots around Norfolk. Um, 13 participants, 1,179 pins. Patrick Stiles with 266 pins. Eduardo, per Eduardo Perez Vega with 181 pins. And Catherine Mogadas, 142 pins. So um, I don't think I've reached out to Measure the Muck personally, but um, Margie, if you don't mind reaching out to those folks and make sure that they get a t-shirt and some stickers, I'd be happy to pass those along. And they got some good data coverage around The Hague couple other ports and Llewellyn actually I did forget I got this one other photo um, Llewellyn uh -huh. Avenue is another big trouble spot um, recurring flooding and um, we got another picture of those cars driving right through the flooding on the street so again if you have any time to play with the app and seek out more of these screenshots that would be awesome 
Um, and then this is kind of a wrap up of our coverage and our extension of partnerships. Um, I just wanted to recognize the Girl Scouts again. They are really awesome. Um, 7,000 girls from Southeast Virginia to Northeast North Carolina. Um, and we're connecting with them through Dave. He helped us get involved with them. And we hope to kind of establish some more mapping teams in that area with those 7,000 girls. Um, it'd be really awesome to establish some regular mapping teams, which we'll talk about a little bit more later as well. Um, but they're a new partnership. This was their field um, part of their, I believe they have a citizen science badge. So they had a field activity component of it, as well as an educational component with which us and a few of our presenters on the call today um, are gonna go in person and work with the girls and, and talk a little bit more about the um, citizen science aspect of it. Um, so really thankful for them and excited to continue that partnership. Um, Friends of the Rappahannock also did some great work with us. They helped us create some maps up in the Northern Neck and Middle Peninsula region. Um, and they also did a lot of really great advertisement for us. They had these really awesome um, social media kind of fact cards that they put out, um, which was really great. So if anybody from Friends of the Rappahannock is on the call, thank you so much um, for doing that. We had a few folks also tag us in some photos of their own mapping. So thank you to those if you're on the call, um, really great photos. And then we had tons of news coverage. So 13 News Now, Virginian Pilot, 3 WTKR. Um, Derek Loftus also got a feature on the Weather Channel. So thank you, Derek, for that and for the shout out to Wetlands Watch. That was really awesome. And I believe this is Wavy TV as well. They did a good spot on how to use the app. Um, so we got pretty good coverage this year and um, it was really awesome. And then to keep the momentum going and keep spreading the word, I'm sure that other folks who are presenting will share their social medias and things like that. Um, but I'll drop some links in the chat a little bit later. We have a Facebook group called Help Catch the King Tide. If you're not part of it already, um, you can find us by just typing in Help Catch the King Tide um, on Facebook. That's where we post updates. We'll post updates leading up to the event, um, photos. You can share your own photos in there. Um, so that's a really good spot if you're not already part of it. And then we have um, our Instagram account where we post reels. Um, we posted a couple tutorial videos for the Sea Level Rise app this year. Um, and so you can find those there as well as um, we have a TikTok, which is awesome. <laughs> so we do them on TikTok now too, um, but we'll always link them on Instagram. So if you haven't seen those yet, um, that would be a great spot. And we also have kind of a recap video of how the event went on TikTok. So you can find us um, at Wetlands Watch. And then one more big last thank you to Karen During at VIMS, Derek Loftus at VIMS, Tom Allen at ODU, Margaret Mulholland with ODU, Dave Mayfield, and all of our TIDE captains. Um, we'll hear a little bit from our TIDE captains later, but really just thank you all so much for helping coordinate this, Wel welcoming me on board. Um, this was a huge event that I was really excited to take on as the newest member of Wetlands Watch. And I'm just so thankful for such a strong and collaborative team. So thank you all so much for, for helping me out. And then um, I might put this on again later, but um, we have kind of a year round mapping interest survey for you guys to fill out. So um, if you can scan this QR code with the um, camera on your phone, there's a couple questions and there's also a chance to provide feedback on the Catch the King event if you haven't done so already. Um, we'd love to hear from you to see how it went. We know there was a little bit of technological difficulty with the app, um, but in general, we just like to hear some feedback. So feel free to fill that box out. Um, and then there's a few questions about um, if you're interested in doing some year round mapping, um, other high tides and rainfall flooding, um, that's data coverage that we'd really love to get. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit more later as well, but feel free to scan that QR code. I'll leave it up for maybe five more seconds. Did it work, Derek? <laughs> cool. <laughs> All right. Um, and then Derek will also go over this a little bit more as well, but you can view the data in a couple different ways. So you can view the data right in the app inside your events. Um, there's a button at the top once you click through to your event and tap pins, you'll be able to see a whole map of all the pins in your region and event. You can also visit, if you haven't already, the Sea Rising Solutions website. It's just www.searisingsolutions.com. Um, and you sign in using the same sign in you do in the app and you can go in and view the data there as well. Um, and then VIMS also has some modeling uh, on their website, which Derek will go over in a little bit, but you can explore those maps as well and see how that data is being um, is helping uh, validate flood models. 
And that's it. Thank you guys so much for participating. Um, again, if you saw your name in the top two on any of the regions, reach out to me at this email with your uh, t-shirt size, um, as well as the best way to get a t-shirt and some stickers to you and we'll coordinate that. Um, so I'll leave that up on the screen for a few seconds in case anybody needs to write it down. And also if you have any photos to share, um, please feel free to email me. We'll be posting things throughout the year and in our future outreach materials. So it'd be great to have a good slew of photos from flood mapping. All right. And then I believe next, let me double check. Next on the agenda is Derek, I believe. Indeed, thank you, Gabby. Yeah. So I wanted to start off before I begin my presentation, just thanking again all of the uh, many AVID volunteers that have helped us collect data over the years. I built this uh, virtual background behind me, uh, constructed from photos over uh, 2020 and 2021, uh, based on a lot of the data that you've helped us collect. As many of these are images that were posted either to the Facebook group or directly collected within the Sea Level Rise app. Uh, so it's really been a kind of exciting to be able to show you all the different cool things that we've been able to do with the data that you've collected. And so that's really kind of what my presentation is uh, all about here. So let me go on ahead and pull that up and get started. So the title of this presentation is basically just how your GPS flood monitoring data is used for modeling. And I say used loosely because in some ways it's used to help us validate the accuracy of those models, but data in their own right can also become their own model. So slowly over time, as you collect enough data, uh, as we kind of showed earlier, and as you'll see in my presentation, you know, the Sea Level Rise app has been around since 2014, and we're getting close to a decade worth of data that you can start to build on a decadal scale. Some information related to where common places that have been flooded in the past are starting to show some changes in terms of how far inland the flooding is happening during these tidal flooding events. Uh, we've gotten some uh, media recognition, and Gabby's covered quite a few of these, but over the last six years of Catch the King, uh, Esri, who develops a lot of the geographic information systems uh, databases, uh, they're the world leader in terms of software that helps you map things. And in many cases, the interactive maps that we build from the uh, data collected from the Sea Level Rise app go directly into Esri's applications. Don Wright, their chief uh, science officer there at Esri, has uh, written a or ghost written a blog about us a couple of times over the year, first in 2017, but also we were featured on Science Friday in uh, 2019 uh, with Ira Flato, along with uh, these videos don't have any sounds just because I plan to talk over them. But for the most part, over the last couple of years, we've had some really great opportunities on a nationwide scale to really tell people about the cool work that you guys have been involved with, um, including uh, several spots on the Weather Channel back in 2020. And uh, as Gabby mentioned earlier, it's like we kind of got a very last minute phone call, like less than 24 hours before we ended up going on TV and wasn't sure if it was actually going to happen until it did. Um, but they've started to regularly feature, um, usually the, about the same week that we do Catch the King every week, year, usually sometime around the third or fourth week of October is their King Tide Week across the U.S. Eastern Seaboard. The king tide doesn't always happen here the same time that it does the highest astronomical tide in some of the lagoons of Florida or areas of South Carolina and North Carolina, but in many cases uh, they kind of coincide usually within the same week or so. And so as a result, that's kind of provided us an opportunity on a nationwide platform to be able to talk about some of the cool work that you guys have been involved in when you collect data with the app developed by Wetlands Watch called Sea Level Rise. Now we've collected data since 2017 and the utility behind the community science work that you're doing uh, really helps us visualize tomorrow's flooding today. You'll be able to capture what's happening during the highest astronomical tide, which is kind of really the uh, core ask from you know, Wetlands Watch along with the Virginia Institute of Marine Science where I work is for you to help collect these data that help us validate the accuracy of flood models. That's my interest in the data, but we also make the data publicly available so that other scientists are working on these types of data sets can also learn a little bit more about specifically what's happening in the Hampton Roads region. And part of the value behind this is it also draws attention to what's happening here in Hampton Roads. As we look at some of these different areas that have flooded year after year after year in different places, but we also realized that, you know, 
makes sense for us to be able to collect data the two to three times a year that some of these spaces flood. But then we build composite maps of all the different places that you've collected data over each of these years. And you can quickly kind of zoom in and see, okay, which place has been monitored in the past and which areas have been shown to flood. And so probably for the last four years or so, we started developing just kind of a fall tidal flooding calendar. Um, there's a group in North Carolina that develops kind of a, uh, an annual calendar that covers all the months of the year. Although in Virginia, in many cases, we find that the flooding in you know, April and May and the spring tides are not usually as significant as those in the fall, primarily due to the fact that you have compounding influences of you know, detritus and leaf litter clogging up storm drainage in the fall. Uh, and that usually kind of makes things a little bit worse in the sense that a lot of the conduits that are designed to make water exit the roadways and a lot of the other uh, public spaces that we kind of tend to collect data during Catch the King uh, will usually become pronounced due to the fact that there's not quite as many drainage outlets. And also in some cases, the water table will be higher due to the several days leading up to the King Tide, making the water table higher and higher incrementally. So with these data, we're really excited to uh, gather nearly a uh, I guess a little over 15,000 high water marks. And uh, I won't go into too much detail on this data set since Gabby did a great job covering uh, all of our major contributors from the different regions, but we really applaud the efforts that you've been involved in. And also wanna thank our year round mappers. Occasionally I have people email me data sets or I'm able to go to the uh, Sea Rising Solutions websites where some of you have made your data events accessible where I can download the data directly from the portal. Um, 18 of you throughout the course of this year, including Joe Bouchard and his team and others have been kind enough to uh, share data with me, Brian Barmore as well. And we collected nearly 2000 GPS high water marks throughout some of these other events where there was flooding that happened outside of Catch the King this year in 2022. Now, of course, the uh, way that we usually try to communicate this information is that you know we've had a large number of media sponsors over the years, along with those that just continue have to uh, tell our story uh, based on individuals that are collecting data. And we really thank them for providing us this type of spotlight from our local media markets, but also from a statewide and nationwide perspective. And so it's really just very fortunate that we've been able to have folks that can help kind of shed light on these issues. You know, part of the uh, passion behind Dave Mayfield's reporting on environmental issues in Virginia for so many years is really what kind of sparked a lot of interest in this early on in 2017 and 2018, but the continued spotlight, the WHRO Public Media, Virginian Pilot, and Daily Press, along with the Virginia Commonwealth Center for Recurrent Flooding Resiliency, have kind of allowed me to be able to dedicate quite a bit of my time to this issue is oftentimes uh, scientists, you know, we have to kind of focus on the issues that are a particular public interest, especially since I'm a state employee. And so this kind of keeps these issues in the public eye where I can continue to work on these uh, cool projects in a lot of variety of different ways. But also media partners have been really helpful in kind of drawing attention to these issues and a lot of the articles that are published from a variety of different sources from weather.gov to others in the past years and even the current year were kind enough to be able to kind of show where people can volunteer for Catch the King and provided links where people can access uh, the sign up for this year's event. And so we really appreciate all of the work that you guys have put into this as volunteers to help us uh, collect relevant data pertaining to flooding in the Commonwealth. And as a result, yes, the first year that we did this event, we collected 59,718 certified high water marks uh, that uh, Guinness World Records was able to recognize that we were at the world's largest environmental survey on the planet in 2017, and we still currently hold the record today. In terms of how your data are used from a modeling perspective, we have an operational forecast model driven by hydrodynamic forecasts at the Virginia Institute of Marine Science, leveraging a model called SCISM developed by Dr. Joseph Zhang in the Center for Coastal Resources Management. Uh, this model runs twice daily at noon and midnight, mostly to predict flooding up to 36 hours in advance. It does this to produce things on a spatial scale in terms of X and Y dimensions at three foot or one meter spatial scale approximately, and it has a temporal resolution of one hourly data. So every individual pixel at one meter resolution throughout the state is updated for every 36 hours. So in this case, for a 36 hour forecast, it's a bunch of 12 hour overlapping forecasts. It updates at noon and midnight. And so over time, we're able to kind of get a picture of what the flooding will look like up to 36 hours in advance. And this model continues to update as we get new data from the National Weather Service in Wakefield, Virginia for Tidewater, Virginia. 
Now, each 36-hour simulation takes about an hour and a half, and the interest behind this in terms of actual computing time uh, is important, mostly because as we continue to increase the resolution of these models, they get more computationally expensive, but also it means it requires a lot more effort to validate the accuracy of the forecasts that are shown in these spaces. As you increase the resolution, you're now relying more heavily on additional data from water level sensors and from citizen science volunteers using their mobile devices like you did using the sea level rise app. As this image collected by Skip Styles back in 2018 shows in the Larchmont neighborhood of Norfolk, essentially these GPS breadcrumbs that you're dropping within the sea level rise app is of monumental importance because our model that's shown on the right was able to quite accurately predict the inundation that was happening at this time during a, uh, a kind of a combined rain and king tide event in September where we had volunteers that were actually being trained around this time on the weekend in September, right before Hurricane Florence kind of grazed us and uh, later in 2018, uh, just probably about a week or so later. And so based on the data that we were able to collect from both of those events, it's particularly useful to show where the flooding is happening. And the shape of the flooding almost perfectly matches um, all of the public spaces that volunteers were able to collect data and help us provide these digital breadcrumbs that validate the data geospatially within these maps. Now, the Sea Level Rise app has been available since 2014 when version 1 came out, and there are just a handful of uh, about a dozen users <laughs> from 2014 to 2016 that were using it. Uh, it wasn't until the inaugural year of Catch the King that a new update for the app came out to version 2.0 and allowed us to uh, engage with a large number of volunteers collecting data. Um, officially, within the uh, Catch the King regions that we set up for the events, uh, we had 718 volunteers that collected data, but then we had dozens more volunteers that ended up creating their own events that over probably six months or so, I continually had people constantly emailing me data sets and sheets that they were able to download with my copy and paste directions and emails to tell them exactly how to download the data from Sea Rising Solutions. Uh, through their website. And overall, we were able to collect over 60,000 GPS high water marks. But by that point, we had already submitted our application to uh, Guinness World Records. And so as a result, that's why the numbers are slightly different there. But each year, we've noticed that it's like the data that you've collected through the Sea Level Rise app has collected cumulatively over 200,000 GPS high water marks. And these are just event related high water not marks, not counting those that are collected within the trouble spots section of the app. And so we we're really excited this year, as Skip kind of pointed out earlier, to kind of get out of that COVID slump of not being able to train new volunteers to use the app. And uh, Karen During and myself are very privileged to be able to present at the uh, Virginia Master Naturalists um, annual event in Virginia Beach back in September, where a couple of you on this video call uh, were able to attend with us. And we're really excited about the data that you were able to collect this year. We essentially take those GPS pins and turn them into contours and then compare those contours with the digital elevation models that are kind of the underlying assumptions behind the gravitational flow elements of our model from hydrologic standpoint perspectives. We just compare each of those points linearly using a mean horizontal distance deviation that tells us, given n the total number of samples, what that difference is in average value for each of these spots. And so I kind of divide them into sites and then translate those information accordingly. The challenge, of course, of the statistical analysis is that while well, we have models that, as I mentioned, are updating hourly for 36 hour forecasts, which means we've got 36 frames of data every time that our model is outputting forecasts. And so as these data are shared, you know, our model has increased in resolution since these examples in 2016. These are some of the first data points that I was able to collect with the sea level rise app back in 2016. And it's really exciting to kind of see how these data have been able to help us validate our model in a variety of different ways. So by the first time we started collecting data with the app in different places, we were able to kind of link in the uh, forecast from our water level sensors through the uh, Tidewatch program at VIMS. And so with those, we have you know tidal forecasts that are driven using uh, data from water levels in real time and helping inform up to 36 hours in advance what those elevations will be from a time series perspective, but the Tidewatch mass map also provides you this information in spatial scale as well. And we plot these usually every year with a map that will kind of give you an idea of what the flooding looks like in your area. And you'll see your data pop up in the map and usually near real time. 
So with this information, we've kind of compared this 8 to 9 a.m., for example, versus 9 to 10 a.m. as the last major publication that we published in the uh, Journal of Marine Science and Engineering back in 2019, showing a lot of the data that you've collected in some of these separate individual events and how they vary hour by hour. And so these deviations differ based on every frame of our forecast. And so even though there may only be flooding during these king tides for one to two, maybe three hours, depending on which direction the wind might be slightly blowing at 15 miles per hour north northeast, this information will cause you know ponding of water in different places. And as a result, we're able to capture that with our model in a variety of different places, like these examples in Norfolk near the uh, Haven Creek boat ramp or some of these spots uh, further up the Lafayette River in Norfolk and these spaces in Virginia Beach accordingly uh, near Little Creek. And so as these spaces flood, we're able to kind of go through and compare hour by hour to figure out not only did it just flood in these areas, but is the duration of the flooding actually mapping specifically the time that there was water ponding on those roadways? Because a lot of the parameters of our model, like friction as a restorative force, can sometimes cause the water to pull up on the flooded areas, kind of like molasses, and never actually return back to the roadway. And so we need to modify the coefficients of static friction in these spaces to represent the relative vegetation there accordingly. And this is particularly important in intertidal wetlands, but also in paved surfaces and other areas where the water doesn't normally belong. So given this information and conclusion, uh, we learned an awful lot as it pertains to hydrologic correction. In many cases, aerial survey data from LIDAR or light detection and ranging using lasers from aircraft um, measuring that backscatter provides us a uh, loose interpretation of what these surfaces uh, that our model should look like, you know, will kind of return back. And the challenge, of course, is that usually bridges over creeks that are usually only temporarily tidal, usually during these highest astronomical tides of the year, typically non-tidal creeks can become tidal. Um, and so as a result, there's other spaces where there's just issues with a very tiny culvert that is not fully digitized within the map, uh, like this example in Norfolk in the Larchmont neighborhood, where you can even see from the satellite imagery that there was dark in those areas. But you can compare where some of these individual points that were collected by volunteers in this map, there were maybe 300 feet from the nearest flooded pixel, were able to calculate those in GIS. And so our geographic information systems will tell you where those deviations exist and we know that there's something that needs to be corrected accordingly. So your data help us in a variety of different ways to be able to interpret where there are spaces where maybe roadways are blocking, uh, where flooding should be occurring, like this three-dimensional model I built for my dissertation in Hurricane Sandy in New York City. It's not just dense urban environments like Norfolk and Virginia Beach. This is an issue that plagues any area that there's regular flooding. And you have to take a lot of special care to be able to rectify these things. And sometimes without your data, uh, it's really particularly difficult to be able to ascertain whether the flooding is actually happening in these spaces. So given the information that we've been able to collect, your GPS high watermarks have helped us highlight new areas that we need to focus on, especially in the Virginia uh, Middle Peninsula and Northern Neck this year with many of the volunteers that helped us collect data up there. We're particularly eager at kind of exploring the influences of flooding in some of those spaces. And so as a result, uh, middle of this year, we started collecting data using drone surveys. You'll hear a little bit more from Tom Allen a little bit later on, uh, talking about the Blue Line projects at Old Dominion University, but also collaborated independently with drone surveys collected by MITRE Tech as well in Virginia Beach and parts of Norfolk. Uh, we've also involved real-time kinematic surveys to help us benchmark where new water level sensors belong uh, for areas that need more re regular monitoring. And ultimately, environmental surveys helped us identify where there's some challenges involved with tidal flooding and uh, the work that is done by Marcy Mulholland and her PhD student, uh, Alfonso Macias Tapia, have done some really great work in terms of calculating total maximum daily loads that you'll hear from them in a second about that. Um, on the vertical scale, our hydrodynamic model was accurate within approximately 1.19 inches or a couple centimeters. And on the horizontal scale, this ended up being approximately three and a half meters in terms of the average of each of those 15,000 um, individual values that were collected during the 2020 to flood forecast relative to the individual GPS data points you collected. We were pretty pleased with that since our model's resolution uh, scales to one meter scale. That's usually a handful of pixels or less for each of those values. 
Now, given Catch the King's ability to help us kind of identify where the hydrologic correction needs to be done, uh, we continue to survey. In most of these cases, the drone surveys are focusing on ditches and narrow creeks, uh, where in these cases, you've got relatively steep drop-offs of water where you've got data that's being collected in these spaces that are typically non-tidal ditches. But folks in rural areas, particularly Matthews County and areas further north of there in the Middle Peninsula, and parts of the northern neck, you'll notice that a lot of these ditches are now being used as kind of conveyance for tidal flooding uh, very deep into those counties, not just areas that are directly contiguous with the tidal floodwaters of Chesapeake Bay. And so this has been particularly important for us to continue to monitor as we're seeing sea level rise happen in real time during these events. Uh, but also engaging uh, you as volunteers to the public to be able to help us collect data. Um, you're able to collect space uh, data and a lot of these areas in this image kind of illustrates where flooding of course floods beyond fences. And so sometimes your data of course are not naturally going to map the full extent of the flooding that may be observed by our models that shows flooding go all the way up to the back doorstep of some of these buildings. And that's perfectly okay because we're happy with, you know, sometimes the statistical error exists just to ensure that, you know, there is flooding happening in these spaces at all. It doesn't have to perfectly match the footprint. We mostly want to be able to identify in other spaces next to where those are they'll tell us what the shape of those footprints of flooding are. And we know based on that contour, the flooding depth must be somewhere around the same proximal depth in areas that you couldn't perfectly match where there are impediments to your movement. So thank you for your help in collecting data on the 29th of October this year during Catch the King. And a big thank you to all the many volunteers and the coordination team that really made this year's Catch the King possible. Thank you so much, Derek. Uh, really, really informative. And I absolutely love that last graphic that you had that kind of had the shutter over the two sets of data. I think that's a really fantastic way to show how that data can be used. So thank you for that. Um, I did receive a message from Tom who will be joining us. There he is, he just popped in. Um, before we pass it over to him, um, I'm going to send just a couple links in the chat. Um, these are just a couple. I have the Facebook group linked as well as the High Water Watch newsletter through Wetlands Watch, which is a great way to um, receive very nice little narrative updates from Skip Styles about uh, flooding um, in the Tidewater area, um, which is a great way in case you want to go out and map. Um, it's a good way to uh, stay informed about flooding happening. And then as well as the VIMS CCRM e-newsletter as well. Um, these are all linked in the agenda, but I'm just going to throw them in the chat. And with that, let me give Tom presenter authority and take it away, Tom. Hey, uh, maybe you see a YouTube picture now, I think. I think uh, what I'd like to do is talk to you about the uh, Blue Line project, which has been awesome to uh, kind of piggyback and compliment on the Catch the King. Uh, the Blue Line project is uh, mimic some other similar, similarly named projects around the country and even in the UK, um, where we seek to envision the future. Of so uh, the blue line in this case represents a line physically on the ground where the eventual high tide mark might be. And so I've in, in, in trained uh, a couple of different years Old, Old Dominion students to actually uh, take either coastal geography or marine geography or a GIS class, geographic information systems, and sort of uh, get this volunteer group to actually mark this on the ground quite scientifically using um, light detection and ranging elevation mapping from uh, either airplanes, drones, or satellites and uh, GIS and surveying and GPS techniques to actually map this. So I'll kick this off by playing a little uh, retrospective video uh, from this group. Uh, we also had uh, complimentary uh, support from uh, lecturer Riley Harris at ODU doing the drone uh, videography and some of the uh, musical attachments. After that, I'm gonna show you the uh, interactive map which you can get to by uh, tinyurl.com slash bluelineodu. So it's been me really need to piggyback this onto the uh, Catch the King broader effort. So with that, I'm gonna go play the video.
you might recognize this as a colonial place in Knitting Mill Creek. Word to the wise, don't host an open house during King Tides. For the second half of this video, uh, I'm highlighting another class of mine, uh, geospatial data analysis, which has uh, been working with uh, mechanical aerospace and oceanography students to deploy drones. Uh, this is our autonomous surface vessel, the Hydrone, and we're using this to map the bathymetry of the creek, which is going to be used to help uh, improve or invalidate some of the models, such as Derek was uh, illustrating. Here are some of our drone pilots from ODU. That's uh, George McLeod is one of them. He's launching a DJI Mavic. And we use that to actually map the footprint on the ground of the King Tide, very similar to uh, several of you volunteers. Uh, we were able to get to some other areas that are interesting. Um, a couple of them are inland, where the tidal water is backflowing up the stormwater infrastructure in flooding areas, sort of discontinuous from the uh, actual creek itself. And a lot of uh, acknowledgments here uh, to both uh, you guys and Catch the King and the NOAA National Oceanic Survey, ODU ICAR, City of Norfolk, who's also uh, facilitated this, and several of my faculty uh, colleagues. Uh, with that, I will stop that and I'm going to pop over to the tinyurl.com and uh, in there you'll you'll find a link uh, in some of our prior uh, propaganda efforts I guess we have a, actually the blue line project uh, logo was designed by an ODU art student so click on the story map you'll actually be able to get to uh, another story map that has interactive maps so uh, if you're familiar with colonial place this is the uh, neighborhoods, Knitting Mill Creek, North Cali Avenue. And uh, we've got delineated here the shorelines of today, uh, 2040, 2050, 2080, and 2100 using NOAA sea level rise uh, projections. Actually, these are uh, some of the same projections that are adopted by the local municipalities for uh, sea level rise and resilience planning. And very interestingly, this part of Colonial Place that we chose this year to focus upon has some fill it, and dredging and uh, dredge spoiled and filled areas and actually some uh, relic uh, tidal creeks that you could see in that video that showed uh, the area where the water wants to go where it once was. And uh, in this case, there's uh, interesting uh, contours in the future shorelines that show they make a V pointing upstream. And uh, as do some of the streets today, uh, we actually were camped out at this area uh, just off Mayflower, I think it's Gosnold Avenue, and uh, water was flowing under the neighborhood, under parcels and up the stormwater infrastructure and flooding on this creek area. Uh, and both us and the drone imagery were able to capture that. Um, so we have other uh, interesting visualizations of this, uh, barring uh, sort of, sort of uh, coastal mega engineering projects, um, which may or may not come to pass, that uh, could be interesting to look at in the future. Um, I've also uh, brought in uh, this, I see Riley Harris is in, in the call now. Uh, other people that are interested in ODU uh, include folks in the art department and uh, education who uh, maybe next year we uh, 
you know, add on an artistic component to this. Uh, Brendan pa Baylor, uh, a textiles uh, specialist, uh, another sculptor, and uh, us have had kind of interesting conversations, could lead to some future possibilities. Um, I don't know if I have Robin or Drew on the line, uh, but they were uh, some students that were on there. If you have anything to add, please pop on in or questions from the audience. Tom, do you also mind giving just a quick intro to yourself? I think a few okay. of us can put together who <laughs> yeah, you are. Um, you just so you can relate to me, um, you know, a couple levels. Um, I'm a native of Portsmouth and a uh, even back to a graduate of Norcom High School, and did my undergrad at Old Dominion University in geography and geology, but now I'm a professor at Old Dominion in geography, and I specialize in GIS and uh, remote sensing applied to coastal environments, um, kind of a combination of both uh, ecological and coastal hazards, so flooding, erosion, sea level rise, and like, uh, and I teach courses in coastal marine geography and GIS now. Recognize several names in the uh, participant list, but haven't met a lot of you either. Um, and, and also at ODU, we have the uh, Institute for Coastal Adaptation and Resilience, ICAR, and I'm one of the faculty involved with that. Uh, but I also would point out um, that we've got uh, resilience themes across the university. Uh, I see we Yusuf is a, on here from uh, public administration and Strom College of Business, uh, Ocean and Earth Sciences, Civil and Environmental Engineering, uh, Geography and Arts and Letters. Uh, so those are kind of some of the sort of prime time departments. Um, and of course, you have Margie uh, Mulholland and Ocean Earth Science with our awesome uh, Measure the Muck. Thank you so much, Tom. Um, we have a Q&A session scheduled for a little later, so I think I will pass it along to Dr. Mulholland if she's ready. I am indeed. Oh, and also just to highlight Blue Line a little bit more, um, this partnership is really awesome because it, it's a great representation as well as Dr. Mulholland's um, presentation up next of how we can expand flood mapping effort efforts. And it's not just a citizen science effort, it's also a public awareness effort. And so um, seeing these folks out there on the street uh, doing these really awesome projects is just a really great showcase of the partnership and how far it can go as far as um, preparedness and resilience and all of that great stuff. So thank you so much, Tom, um, for your continued partnership and support. And I'm excited to see where we can take it. Great. So you ready for me to go? All yeah. right. <laughs> Sorry. So as I said before, I'm Margie Mulholland, and I'm a professor in ocean and earth sciences at ODU. And um, we decided to take advantage of Capture the King and do a Measure the Muck event. My initials are MM, and we had to find a catchy uh, name. So that was it. <laughs> and like I said in my introduction, is when we were beta testing the first versions of the phone app, uh, we would go out as a family and I just kept thinking, ew, this stuff is gross in this water. And uh, I knew I was at the time sitting on the Chesapeake Bay Program Scientific and Technical Advisory Committee. And so I knew the models weren't counting anything that was going into the water as a result of tidal flooding. And so that was sort of the inspiration for this. And I have to thank Alfonso Macias Tapia, the PhD student who did most of the work, I just get to talk about it, and the army of volunteers that really collected all the samples, and Derek for calculating all those uh, flood volumes. Sorry, your net last name got lost in the black there. And I also need to thank the Hampton Road Sanitation District because they actually uh, paid for us to be able to do this. So that was really uh, necessary to be able to analyze all the samples we created. But some of this I've, I've said already, but that we're trying to restore the Chesapeake Bay and a lot of the impairments that we're trying to restore the bay with have been linked to human activities. Things like nutrient inputs from fertilizers, urban uh, and suburban and agricultural runoff, groundwater, wastewater treatment plants. 
And some of these impairments, and one that I work on, is harmful algal blooms. And this is a picture uh, in the James River during a harmful bloom event. And this is a picture of a bioluminescent harmful algae that made the front pages of the newspaper <laughs> when it was blooming. And so these can be quite uh, alarming and eye-catching events when we have them. And I just wanted to give you a, a 101, one slide primer on the restoration, but the original restoration agreement that was made in 1985 was non-binding. And since the restoration showed insufficient progress by 2010, the EPA stepped in because there was a consent decree in Virginia and Washington DC. And then that was followed by the Obama executive order. And when the EPA stepped in, they set total maximum daily loads for the bay-wide <laughs> segment by segment. So that is essentially the nutrient diet that you've heard that the bay is on. And there are, these are segment specific. So there are 92 smaller TMDLs. And I'll tell you why this is relevant in just a little bit, but um, all the regulated sources include things from the end of a pipe or point sources. And then they also include non-point source runoff. And, but not anything to do with uh, coastal flooding. If you want more information about the TMDL, I put links in my presentation. So you're um, welcome to go look up uh, more. But essentially, as I said, when we were out looking around, um, what loads are we missing in these TMDLs? What loads are we not accounting for? And how are we cheating on that nutrient diet that we're putting the bay on? We're counting runoff, like I said, but we're not counting flooding on this scale. When you have whole roadways underwater and whole neighborhoods underwater, cars underwater. So we're just not counting it. And in this region, we're not limited to runoff during storms. We have flooding when the skies are blue, as everybody knows who has been part of this sampling. And so it's a real problem and it's not being counted. And this is a figure from Tal Ezer's, uh, a paper he did, and it just shows the hours per year above mean high, high water. And it's in feet, which is um, uh, weird, but uh, it's essentially the hours per year above mean high, high water. And you can see from this that it's increasing and it's not really a linear increase. It's increasing rapidly. That amount of time we're in a flooded state. Okay, so it floods, it's hard to get around. So it's really inconvenient because cars go underwater, you know, intersections get clogged. And you've all seen this during the measure, the, the, I mean, the catch the king mapping, but on land, we're starting to adapt. Signs are going up in different places to show you where not to park, not to drive fast through the water, if you're gonna drive through it at all and tell you how high that water got. And so we're adapting on land. And most of the efforts to date to adapt or mitigate effects of sea level rise have focused on the landward side of the equation and protecting infrastructure, things like um, notifying, you know, not repopulating buildings that get routinely flooded or raising houses and things like that. So most of what we're doing is on land, but I wanted to start thinking about what was happening on the water side of the equation. We see these little, signs that Scotty Harper put all over our drains and uh, in the city of Norfolk showing that this water drains to the Chesapeake Bay. And this is a picture of flood water. And all that is in that water is draining back into the bay when flood waters recede. Um, Alfonso made this really nice cartoon of the flood wa the water sitting nicely in its well-behaved estuary. And here we have flooding and it comes up on land and pretty much anything on the landscape winds up going into that, into the estuary when the floodwaters retreat. And this includes construction materials from building, garbage, uh, car oil. And this is one of my favorite neighborhoods to go sample when it floods. Uh, it's a student housing area on 52nd Street in Norfolk. And there's always tipped over garbage cans in the water. And it's wrong on so many levels because usually the recycling bin is full of trash. <laughs> and actually a funny anecdote about this site is one time I was there sampling and someone came out, saw that their trash can was underwater and they had a bag of trash they were gonna deposit. And they, they looked at it, they started walking back to the house, they turned back around and just flung the bag of trash right in the water. <laughs> and so this stuff happens. <laughs> Sadly, and the load 
it, we know that it's the load is unquantified. And in these pictures here, you can see the oil sheen on this water. So we know it's not just nutrients, it's other contaminants as well, but we really don't have the capacity to measure all of those. But anyway, here's some pictures of things going in. There's all sorts of litter. We sort of have little contests about who can find the grossest thing in the water when we're mapping. Uh, like I said, trash cans and just bags of trash. Um, lots of uh, animal waste. We got our dog to pose for this picture. So we cheated a little. And here's the, um, you know, the water just bubbling up the strain, uh, the drain, sewer drains. And in this picture, you can't really see it very well, but there's actually toilet paper coming out, back up out of the drain. One of my students took that picture. But why do we care? Well, all these unaccounted for nutrient loads are leading to impairments. And these include harmful algal blooms that can kill fish and uh, just cause other ecological damage in the bay. And this is a picture, this is the um, uh, Hampton Roads Bridge and here's the Yacht Club here. And we monitored this site a lot, but this is a picture taken from an overflight of this discolored water that's all algae. And this is the bioluminescent algae that made the stir and now occurs during the summer a lot, quite often. And, um, and my question is essentially, how can we hope to the restore the bay if we don't count these nutrients? And in fact, just last week, another bay report card came out and sure enough, it's not improving again. We still got a D plus in terms of water quality. So what we wanted to do by measuring the muck, it's actually pretty difficult. It sounds easy, just measure nutrient concentrations, right? In it, well, you have to have hundreds of samples to be statistically relevant um, and they have to be collected synoptically near high tide. So you have to have lots of samples all at once. So you can't just have a couple people going out and doing that. You need a really a small army and they need to be deployed at the same time. And so we also, so if you're gonna, uh, harness that army, you need to pick a time when you know they'll be flooding in advance. So the Catch the King events, that was perfect because we knew there was flooding, we knew there was um, public interest being raised, and then, um, and we also knew that the high schoolers needed volunteer hours. <laughs> so we uh, took advantage of high school students as well. We also needed to be able to calculate the floodwater volumes based on the extent of flooding. And that's where Derek came in because he was doing just that and having those models um, be improved through all the Catch the King data. And we needed to know what was already in the estuary before the flooding happened because you don't wanna count that, right? You have to subtract that back out from your load. So there were a lot of things we needed to know. So we tapped into the Capture the King Tide so thank you, Wetlands Watch. We thought of that catchy name, Measure the Muck, and we engaged students. And in particular, we targeted the AP Environmental Sciences classes from Maury and Granby High School. And so they came out. And we also had ODU uh, graduate students and personnel involved. And what we did is we had additional trainings. They were trained to map, but we also trained them to collect water samples while they mapped. And then we, we provided them with kits for, um, for sampling. And the next, the last thing we had to do is find an accessible watershed to work in where we could get a lot of samples. We wanted it to have its own TMDL. And so we targeted the Lafayette River because it is a small tributary that has its own TMDL and it's near to ODU's campus. And this is a picture just uh, of the Lafayette River watershed. Uh, and there's a lot of Catch the King volunteers in this area too, and we know there's lots of tidal flooding, and this is just a figure showing, I forget how much, I think it's a foot of flooding or a meter of flooding in the Lafayette River, um, and that's all marked in red as what should be underwater, and so we use the Lafayette River. On the day of the Capture the King event, I got a teaching lab that I reserved, and we had these cooler kits that we filled with sample bottles, gloves, um, the, everything they would need, uh, a clipboard to do manual writing of samples, but essentially we armed them with these sample kits, gave them a map and sent them out to a particular area to collect the samples. And then when all the samples came back, we liked them back within an hour-ish of high tide, um, we processed all these samples in the lab and some of the students helped. So really it was just an army of people in there. Um, and this is Alfonso here. 
packing the coolers, <laughs> just so you know. Um, yeah, and then we sent the groups out. They did the maps of the floodwaters here. They did, they sampled, and um, usually they were teams of four. So one pe person could be recording manually, another could be mapping, another sampling, and another uh, actually using the phone app to log in the sample and put the sample number in the phone app at the site where they sampled. And then they would take a picture and make a note in the phone app. So the phone app was great actually for sampling. That said, we still did the manual log because sure enough, when we compared the two, you know, people would forget to do one or the other all routinely, but we had uh, redundant records. And then once we started have re having results, we could essentially map these onto um, the, the study site with the flood water volume superimposed. And we did this to sort of look for hot spots for where the nutrient loads are bigger. And here, these bigger green circles are higher concentrations uh, of nitrogen. And in this case, it's just ammonium. So it's a form of nitrogen, don't worry about that. But that's just the sort of products we can do. And then from this, we were able to really simply calculate a nutrient load for the system. And so what we did is we calculate the nutrient load and all we needed to know was that volume of flood water, the median flood water nutrient concentration, and then we had to subtract the concentration that was already in the river from that and multiply you know, the difference by the flood water volume. And so we did this, this is just a sample calculation for 2017, we accounted for error and all that in these, but in 2017, we calculated that there was 2,784 2, pounds of nitrogen from nitrate alone delivered to the estuary. And now that number doesn't mean a lot right now, but I'm just gonna say in the next slide, I'm gonna show you what that means. <laughs> but the floodwater volume in each year, it actually varied from year to year. And of course, during the pandemic years, we had fewer volunteers, but we still were able to collect, you know, almost 200 samples per year. So we were felt very fortunate about that. And the flood water volume, it varied a little bit per year as did the height of the mean seawater. Okay, but remember that about 2,800 pounds of nitrogen and don't get lost with all these numbers here. <laughs> I know it's crazy, but essentially this is the TMDL format. And this is the Lafayette River that I've highlighted here. So only look at this line. And the total nitrogen allowed per year to be delivered for the Lafayette River by this TMDL is 1,941 pounds. So what we found is that for nitrate alone during that single year, about one and a half times of the annual load of nitrogen was delivered during the single blue tide flooding event. And so that's a lot, it's not, and it's not being counted toward the TMDL. And this is the TMDL for runoff, mind you. So just the overland flow, it's bigger for when you count the, the total load with the everything at the end of the pipe. But essentially, we were really conservative in our calculations, and we didn't consider organic components or particulate, you know, from the sediment that came in. And this was a calculation for a single event. So we knew that there's also some variability in the load, very likely due to seasonality. You might have pollen on the street versus leaf litter, et cetera. Um, the landscape prehistory, if it's, if it's just rained for five days in a row before it flood, you can think that the load might be less than if it had been dry for the previous five days. And then there are lots of different land uses. And you can imagine from an impervious surface versus a lawn, you know, the load might be different. And so what we also did was we sampled at certain sentinel sites almost every time it flooded. You know, and we tried to pick different land uses to do that. And I'm going to show you here just sort of the penultimate results from a lot of that. And I know it's it's busy, it's a, a busy figure, but essentially I'm going to walk you through it so uh, to tell you what we found. But essentially, we found this is each of the different flooding events where we sampled um, at a different sites and at different flood water volumes or mean high high water that it got to that day. And this is just the nutrient load. It's the difference in the nitrogen from what was in the estuary and what was in the floodwaters. And essentially what you can see is there is a pattern, even though there's a huge amount of variability, there's a pattern that the more flooding you get, the more nitrogen gets loaded. And this is nitrogen, this is phosphorus. And it's sort of true for both of them. The more 
the more flooding there is in general, the more nitrogen there is, but it is highly variable. Um, Alfonso also just went and backcast uh, the nutrient load based on water levels from Sewell's point. And what he found is essentially as uh, the flooding has increased over time, so has the nutrient load. So we're increasing nutrient loads by quite a lot as a result of tidal flooding. And these are new, these are in a paper he hasn't even submitted yet, or they'll be in other part of his thesis. The last thing I wanna talk about that's also alarming is the Virginia Department of Health and HRSD both ran 20 samples for us each year for fecal uh, material loading. And these are just box and whisker plots showing the mean um, fecal indicator number and the maximum and minimums and the range with the standard deviation. So, and then this red line at the bottom, that is what is allowable for recreational water use in Virginia. Okay, so they close beaches above this red line. And all of the most, most all of the samples, very few were even close to that line. And many of them were off scale. And the highest number we could get with the assay was 24,000. That's just off scale. The Virginia swimming standard is 104, and it's a really weird unit. It's called a most probable number, but that's you know what the assay measures. So, uh, but the upshot is there's a lot of fecal contamination in that water. And I've seen kids out there when we've been sampling, treating a flood day, because we have had them in Norfolk where the buses can't make it to the bus stop and they delay school, but the kids are out playing in the water, you know, running around, jumping, getting their boogie boards out and it's gross. And here's a picture uh, taken a long time ago by one of my former students of someone swimming down uh, by the Hague in that water. And so given our fecal matter results, I would argue, no, 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 <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> and so what I wanna leave you with is just this climate change and flooding, it's gonna impact our restoration efforts. You know, Not only is it impacting things on land, but it's impacting our restoration efforts. And so we need to uh, put some resources into better um, custody, um, custody of our landscape or in taking care of it. And so that we can do reduce some of the water quality impairments. You know, maybe there needs to be flood alerts so people clean up their yards, you know, sort of like the River Stars program of the Elizabeth River project. You know, maybe we need a flood star program. <laughs> so people uh, clean up their landscapes. But with that, I just want to thank, again, all the volunteers and all the Catch the King support that we had, all the volunteers for Measure the Muck, the high school students, the teachers, and also the Hampton Road Sanitation District for, you know, without whose funding, we wouldn't have been able to do this at all. So thanks, everybody. Thank you so much, Margie. I said, wow, once in the chat, but I wanted to say <laughs> I think maybe eight more times because I certainly was not aware of all of the data you just shared. So thank you for collecting that. It looked like an awesome time for the students too. That's the kind of lab work um, I wish I could go back to in college. So yeah. um, thank you so much for sharing that. And again, echoing what we said about Blue Line, it's really great to have these kind of extension programs to kind of round out all the information we can collect with this kind of citizen science event. So thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. So our next kind of 15 minute block and we'll go uh, as little or as long as we need to is just, I'm gonna open the floor for q and I'm gonna throw the photo slideshow back um, up on the screen in case anybody didn't get a chance to see some of the photos that came out of Catch the King. Um, but I will open the floor to everybody if you have questions, comments, um, general feedback, if you have a story to tell, um, now would be a fabulous opportunity and then we'll open the floor up to a couple of our tide captains to talk about year round mapping. So if you're interested in um, doing some mapping throughout the year with high water and rainfall flooding, um, feel free to stay on the call and uh, check that out a little later. I uh, get everybody, uh, Brian Daniel. I'm, uh... A uh, volunteer mapper in Norfolk, uh, retired Navy, uh, 25 years, been stationed here for a, a long time. I'm also a, a clean water captain for uh, Chesapeake Bay Foundation. And 
I just want to say thank you to all of the organizations that were involved in this. I absolutely love seeing all these pictures and all the, the uh, explanations of how these uh, samples are being used and analyzed. It's uh, really great to see. Um, I, I plan on being a full-time uh, uh, captain uh, if I uh, signed up for that. And I have the intention on contacting the area bases for uh, like public affairs offices and stuff to see if we can get some environmental coordinators from the bases uh, involved in this to raise awareness and maybe get volunteers for future events. I mapped the Little Creek base uh, around the marina this year. And if I can get more volunteers on the bases, maybe we can map around them because I know it impacts future uh, readiness of our uh, military. So uh, hopefully we can get some data on those bases for, for you guys. Hey, Brian, can I just say a quick response to that is, you know, that's one of our problems with measuring the muck sometimes is we can only go to publicly accessible property. So, you know, being able to get on the base, you know, where again, land use is so different would be absolutely fabulous to be able to get some numbers. What we eventually want to do with all of this is uh, sample more land use types and then scale up Bay wide, you know, via models and, you know, perhaps the whole East Coast of the US be able to scale up based on based on land use type. And I know Tom has helped Alfonso a lot as well with, you know, trying to better understand the land use and its impact on what the load is going to be to the water. So that'd be great if you could get samplers on the base. Yeah, I'll do what I can. Yeah, thank you so much for that. Like echoing um, what Margie just said, the publicly accessible spots are really all we can promote, but the more teams that we have in those um, privately owned areas is going to do immense wonders for, for data modeling and data collection. So thank you. And we'll definitely be in touch. Um, and you said you did fill out the interest mapping form? Yes, I did. Awesome. Thanks so much. Uh, Frank Polster out of James City County, if I can. Um, one of the remarkable things about uh, this presentation is the diversity in the different communities. And of course, the focus in the urban areas in the Norfolk, Virginia Beach area. Uh, but some of those same issues, I think, are relevant to the non tidal areas. And, and I'm from James City County, uh, as well as the Middle Peninsula. And so trying to make that uh, connection in terms of the last presentation and what that means uh, for increased precipitation and flooding and non-tidal flooding uh, is uh, something I got to scratch my head about, especially when at least uh, two of our watersheds have uh, TMDL for um, uh, fecal uh, pieces on that. So I, I need to think about that. Uh, piece. But but the other thing that, that I liked about that last presentation is the assumptions uh, in the compilation of the data was very clear. And one of the things that uh, Derek Loftus and I have gone through over, and I've made this comment to uh, Skip over the last, uh, since 2017, is that the LIDAR data uh, that we have, we don't have the LIDAR data in James City County. And so the uh, predictions that he's had over a number of years, uh, frankly, don't match up to some of the uh, restoration projects that we've had uh, for it. And, and so my point is, is that uh, first off, as I found out today, that uh, there is going to be LIDAR data at one meter intervals available for James City County, which is the basis for Derek's assumptions of the impacts of, uh, of uh, sea level rise coordinated with the different predictions. And so my point is, is that we need to take uh, advantage of that data to look at the mitigation strategies that communities have put in. And, and the reason this came out in 2017 with Derek was the Jamestown Beach uh, did a stream restoration with groins. And so his prediction showed where the sea level rise is going to be, which didn't bear out by the data. And, and since then, we've done several projects in the Chickahominy Riverfront, uh, the Grace Run, and the most the most 
impressive uh, shoreline restoration project was on the Carter Grove for almost 1.3 miles that I sent Skip a video of to see that. And so <clears throat> as we go forward, it's not only the problems that we see from the data, but it's also the successes of these restoration projects that we have and so that we have the accurate data. Now, I don't know about the LIDAR data for the rest of those communities, but I know that when I try to convince people that there's a problem here in James City County, it's hard for me to argue that because I'm not certain that the underlying assumptions of, the, of, of what we have is correct. And I only leave that just because I think we're gonna get better, but we need to continue to challenge the underlying assumptions that these predictions are based on. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Uh, Derek or Margie, do you guys have any comments on that? Sure, I can comment first, I guess, on the uh, LIDAR uncertainties in the Jamestown Beach area. I know we've been using a LIDAR survey that was you know, conducted by the U.S. Geological Survey based on merged digital elevation models throughout this area. And it is retrieving data from a 2013 LIDAR survey, so it does not include the information from Jamestown Beach's recent restorations. And Frank and I have talked about this a couple of times because we've kind of hoped that there would be a new LIDAR survey. We've talked to VITA at the state level. In fact, there was supposed to be a LIDAR survey flown in 2020, and then the pandemic kind of delayed that till I believe late 2021. And then I'm not sure if that LIDAR survey has already happened but hasn't been processed yet or where it stands so far. Um, but there is supposed to be, as Frank said, the new LIDAR survey at one meter point spacing uh, for that area that would be able to be something that we can then integrate into our uh, model. But as it stands, he's correct. It's been that way for probably the last five years or so now <laughs> since the uh, first Catch the King. Um, and we've integrated the uh, previous LIDAR survey into our map, which is based on 2013 data, uh, which is, now about a decade old. Um, so the hope is always to continue to update the model with new information, but until that's done, you know, you're not going to have the correct flood elevations for those areas. And this is where the question from volunteers comes in pretty often, you know, is it really useful for me to map beaches because the sand even from erosion from one year to the next can vastly shape dune structures and back swales of beaches if you're mapping where water comes up behind the dunes in sound environments, you know, we see this pretty frequently and the answer is yes, it is useful for us because in many cases, we'll get access to when these new LIDAR surveys come in, either whether they're hosted by the state at VITA or whether they're coming in from uh, post damage assessment surveys when major storm surges happen, usually NOAA along with the US Geological Survey will collect data and we'll go in and assess, you know, what is the dune profile shape, how has it changed since the previous survey. And when those new surveys come in, it allows us to reevaluate how the shape of, you know, it's, for example, we've had a lot of people collect data on Willoughby Spit in Norfolk, along with large portions of Virginia Beach. And we're seeing a lot of beaches now in the Middle Peninsula and Northern Neck that have been newly mapped by volunteers in this year's Catch the King. And so as we get new data for those communities, um, as Frank pointed out, I don't think it covers all of the communities in that area. I think it was James City County, parts of Fort Eustis, and parts of Newport News, it looks like, that were in this survey uh, that was recent. I think it's either on the docket to be flown or has already been flown but not been post-processed yet. But once we have those LIDAR data, our plan is usually to integrate them into our uh, Tidewatch map. So, Derek, my uh, GIS person says it's in post-processing, so... We'll see it soon, and of course, I'll send it along. But but the follow-on to that is is that you know we're all different in terms of uh, tidal flooding, and with the increased set of precipitations, uh, one of the issues that that I'm trying to look at is the idea that we're going to see the receding of shorelines in tidal areas that start to encroach into the RPAs and go up the rivers mm -hmm. area. So the mapping of that is important because we're going to lose tax dollars to that. And we need to look at ways that we can mitigate that flow of that river receding into areas so that it's protected. And so this data that we're talking about with your mapping and the other things that you're doing in VIMS become very important to us to make decisions about where we are for mitigation strategies over the next 20, 30 years. And so I applaud you and the folks over at VIMS for what you're doing to provide us the science of what we need to do. Thank you.
Absolutely. Well, we also appreciate the help from Wetlands Watch. I know their CRS uh, management with uh, uh, Madison Teeter, along with the efforts of uh, Mary Carson Stiff, have really been very helpful over the years. I know James City County currently, I think, is uh, the highest rated in the CRS program as a class five community. And you guys have made use of literally every form of data possible to help identify where these riparian protection areas are. And I know it kind of undercuts the value of these data when you're sending volunteers out there to collect data, knowing it's not going to match the map based on our older LIDAR data. And, and we need to have a higher level of, of the freeboard area in our flooded areas that are projected. And your data allows us to start to put ordinances that start to make those areas that we know are going to be flooded. And so the reliability of that data in your mapping is so important. Definitely. Margie, did you have something to say as well? I apologize. Uh, oh, no, 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 not really. But, you know, in terms of looking at water quality impacts, I was just going to point out how woefully inadequate our monitoring is of anything. And we, when we put in these, when we implement these um, restorations and whatnot, we don't monitor to see whether they're working or for how long they're working. You know, there's just uh, not enough money in the world to even determine whether some of these things that are being impl implemented are helping. And so, you know, just wanted to make that point as well as it's, we need more monitoring. Yeah, and tagging on to that part of that year round mapping effort and kind of where we envision the app going to at least get that baseline flooding data. Um, we hope to push it in kind of non coastal communities as well to see if we can establish some teams who are boots on the ground ready when it rains, um, we can at least have some people who are out there willing to go out, get a little bit wet um, and record that rainfall flooding so we can see where those trouble spots are and know where we need to monitor in the future. So that's that's gonna be a huge push, um, at least on our side um, and collaborating with everybody as far as data collection goes um, to get more coverage in non-coastal areas as well um, to see where that rainfall flooding is really um, impacting. So that is in our minds and an active goal, absolutely. Yeah, um, this is Skip Styles. Let me just throw a slide up here to show you what we're what we're facing. Um, I'm going to knock knock Gabby out here. Um, so there's been some work done recently on increased rainfall intensity. This is some work that was done um, basically by the Chesapeake Bay program. But what it's showing is what they found out after Matthew. It's we're getting more rain that those rain bombs and that rain intensity that we're all experiencing is real. And so here's a, here's a, a sample of, of the, the, the work that was done at um, Sewell's Point at the Naval Station. And this is for a 50 year storm. And you get out here on a 24 hour end of it. And this Atlas 14 line here of seven point, call it eight inches. That's the current rainfall estimate that we use in all of our stormwater work, all of our design. But what this is finding is that actually that bottom number, eight and a half inches, is what's actually happening. So we're we're designing our stormwater systems based on last century's rainfall. And so what we're going to try to do as we move this app inland and start dealing with rainfall flooding is to begin to collect data on that missing piece. And so and also to be able to bring into it some of the compound stuff, you know, these, these storms that we get where there's sea level rise and coastal flooding, and then you get rainfall on top of it, and you get compound flooding, that's a total mess. Or you get, um, you know, in the northern neck where you've got a lot of beach and bluff, there, it's only the fringes that are getting wet, but inland, we're getting a whole lot of rainfall that's flooding these areas out. So we want to better understand it. And I think also moving into the rural areas, we want to better understand where the flooding is in, in the ditches, because um, we've been working up in Matthews County for quite a while, and there's ditches up there that when we started working in 2008 were dry, and they're now tidal features. There's Spartina growing in those ditches. And so what we want to do is, is to start working on that issue, because a lot of those ditches are owned by VDOT, and VDOT may or may not want to deal with those ditches, but they're going to have to. But if we can begin to present the data about where um, this flooding is occurring, and then with the lateral ditches, where it's taking this flooding inland to, to communities, 
um, I think that's going to be an important piece of this as well. Skip, that's my argument for the LIDAR data, because at one meter, you can't do that unless you can make that, you can't make that argument unless you have that elevation data. Right. And Frank, you know, what's really interesting, we were talking to folks in Pocosin a few years ago, because NASA's right next door, and NASA was mapping NASA Langley with some extremely precise data. They were actually able to get ditch elevation. I mean, they must have had a vertical, a vertical error of about a half an inch because of the, the work that um, NASA was doing and they overflew Pocosin and gave them the data. And that was, they were able to start working on their ditches in ways that no other locality in Virginia can. Well, my last point will be that I hope that the legislature and, and the last lady that the Admiral that we had advocated for the update of the Atlas 14. And if they don't do that, they should use the Marissa data because you can do it at the county level. And so this is ridiculous not to be able to use that data. The VDOT has at least looked at a 20% increase on their bridges. So yes. why in the world are we waiting? The, um, the, the update of that official data is underway. It's been delayed. We were hoping to get it in 20, the end of 2023, 24 maybe. Um, there are seven states that have gone together now, from Pennsylvania all the way down to South Carolina, they've asked for the updated data. So we're hoping that with a little congressional pressure, we can speed that process along. Great. Yeah, that was all thanks to uh, Admiral Phillips. Yes, and I hope she stays around. Awesome. Thank you, Skip, and thank you, Frank. Um, Frank, I know you and I chatted a bit too, and you sent plenty of awesome photos and data. So thanks for coordinating your team down there. Um, we're gonna, I'm gonna switch over to the year round mapping with tide captains really quick. Um, I'm happy to stay on past eight if anybody has any remaining questions or feel free to reach out um, with emails. If um, anybody who presented today minds dropping their email in the chat, just in case there's a specific question. Um, I just wanna be mindful of everyone's time. So I'm gonna hand it over to a Joe Bouchard, who is one of our tide captains down in Virginia Beach. And um, it's a good segue as we talk about expanding um, our mapping efforts um, into this year round mapping that we keep talking about. Um, again, if there's interest in doing some mapping throughout the year, not just around Catch the King, um, do fill out that form, but I will send it over to Joe and let me know if you don't have that share screen button at the bottom. Uh, hang on. Okay. Can everyone see that pathetic excuse for a map? Yes. <laughs> it's a okay. beautiful map. Um, it is a beautiful map. <laughs> I'm going to just take five minutes to uh, show you how I organize my Virginia Beach team. Uh, first of all, I have a map uh, of potential mapping sites. This is just Northern Virginia Beach. I have a second one for Southern Virginia Beach and the Eastern branch of the Elizabeth River. Uh, and all of these places, uh, I have personally explored or my tide mappers have explored. So I know they're good places to map. If it's on private property, I note that it's in green. Uh, but I have mappers that live in those areas and map them. So uh, I offer my team a whole bunch of places they can go map. OK, next one. Next slide. Oh, oh I do. I it. Never mind. Oh. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> that you're doing it. OK. And then every month, this is what I prepared for the King Tide. Every month, uh, I send them uh, the forecasted time of high tide at a whole bunch of locations. And I tell them, uh, choose the location that's closest to where you want to map and go there at that time. Um, I do this because, uh, you know, we can't. In Virginia Beach, we can't use the Sewell's Point uh, NOAA prediction. And for that matter, we can't use the NOAA predictions for Cape Henry or Lynn Haven uh, at the pilot station there. Uh, 
because the actual time of high tide can vary significantly uh, around the city. Uh, so I give them precise estimates and uh, I go back and validate these annually. And this map shows you that two things. First, the locations where I provide estimates. Now, some of them come from NOAA, where you see the uh, NOAA icon, uh, where you see the US Geologic Survey icon. Uh, they don't do forecasts. They just monitor actual water levels. But that's what I use to make my forecasts. Uh, so, for example, uh, in, uh, in the Lynn Haven estuary in the eastern side, uh, way down at the bottom at Little Neck Creek, there's a U.S. Geologic Survey water level sensor. And I collect the data there and I compare it to two things, to the NOAA forecast for Lynn Haven Inlet and the U.S. Geologic Survey there. And uh, average out the difference. Um, I have to do that because uh, the U.S. Geologic Survey water level sensors can be affected by a lot of things. Uh, at Lynn Haven Inlet, even passing boats can give erroneous read readings. Uh, but if I average it over a long period of time, I get a pretty good uh, uh, estimate of the time difference between Lynn Haven Li uh, Inlet and Little Neck Creek. And then from there, it's just linear extrapolation for all those sites. And it works pretty good. I have my tide mappers tell me, did it look like high tide? Did I get it right? Um, and I do the same thing along uh, the Atlantic Ocean shoreline and the Chesapeake Bay shoreline. Um, the, uh, if you'll notice on the central and western branch of the Lynn Haven Inlet or the Lynn Haven Estuary, uh, I don't have as many sites where I make predictions. I easily could, but uh, I've had fewer mappers interested in those areas. If I get more mappers who want to map there, then I'll start making predictions for more sites. Now, once I have built this mathematical model, uh, then it's real easy uh, month after month to provide the estimated times of high tide. Uh, and as I say, I'll go back and uh, validate it uh, to make sure I'm as accurate as I can be. Uh, but anyway, this is the service I provide to the tide mapping team. Uh, I give them uh, a large number of suggested places they can map. And uh, I let them know when they need to be there. So uh, their time is spent productively. Uh, end of sermon. You sure you don't want to show the fish photo? Oh, the fish, the fish, the fish. <laughs> Gabby, thank you for reminding me. Of course. And... Uh, that, I think, is a baby striper. It's swimming up 28th Street in Virginia Beach, which was <laughs> flooded uh, during the king tide. And I think he was headed uh, to the Mojito Cafe, which was about a block up the street from where he was. So that fish wanted the party. That's awesome. Hey, hey Joe, uh, Joe, you weren't in the Navy, were you? <laughs> Indeed, I was. <laughs> How can you tell? These streets are getting close to being navigable waterways. <laughs> well, I think the streets in Virginia Beach need to be some kind of marine sanctuary now. <laughs> That's hey, funny. Joe, I was going to say, I would love to get your map of sampling sites on the eastern branch because, like I said, we're try trying to expand our efforts to other branches with you know, different land uses. The Eastern branch is the one we're gonna to try to target in the fall. 
Okay, was that Margie? Yeah, it's Margie. Okay. Um, sure, I'll send that to you. That'd be great. Thank you. You are most welcome. Thank you so much, Joe. Um, and to recap that, this is an exemplary uh, example of uh, leadership in our Tide Captains and leading a mapping team. So if this kind of stuff, um, if you feel like this, some, this is something you'd like to do, if you know someone who might be interested in doing these kinds of map leading, um, we can work on trying to get some kind of toolkit together similar to what Joe has here. Um, so we can provide those resources, or if you're interested in leading it all on your own, let us know. Um, that interest survey is the place. Um, and then I hope Brian Barmore is still on the call. Brian, are you still here? Yes, I am. Awesome. Would you like to round us out these last couple minutes? Brian is another one of our Tide Captains with the Master Naturalists on the peninsula, um, and I got to work closely with him um, during this past Catch the King. So um, Brian, go ahead and take it away. Sure, and I must say, I, I, I'm not sure if I'm inspired or overwhelmed by what <laughs> Joe has put together, but that was very impressive. And actually, Joe, I'll probably reach out to you because one of my things that I think would be really good to have is those lists of uh, particularly publicly accessible places um, so that when we get people in you know, joining that they, they have ideas of, of where to go. Because some people have um, local neighborhoods and local areas, um, and but many don't. And actually, that's one of the things. So um, I started as a tide captain back, I guess, in the 2017 one, um, and have been doing it since then. And we had a a group. It was a small group, probably five or six of us, that would would do these ad hoc um, year round measurements, particularly when storms were coming in. We'd have some folks go out and map. Um, but what, what I really saw from that was it, it either was people that had it very close. I know one guy like lived on the beach and he'd go out when he walked his dog and, and would map that. Or, you know, I would do the backyard if it got into the backyard or the local park. Um, so it seemed to be people that had it really close and probably also really impacted. Um, and so that that's something I'm not sure I have a great solution to, but to try to make sure that we get people when we're trying to do the year round mapping um, to have places they can go quickly to do it that's easy for them um, to get to. Um, so yeah, I think that's kind of the the biggest thing that that I took away from that was you know we had a lot of people involved at the catch the king tide but throughout the year it was you know a little harder to, to get people out there um, every time i i am interested in some of the discussions about things like the um, roadside drainage ways and um, things like that maybe that's some place some place where i can also think about trying to encourage people. I know I have one near me where it's, you know, basically a runoff drainage into a tidal creek. Um, most of the time, <laughs> it kind of stays within the nice bounds. Um, so yeah, it, at some point after the fourth or fifth mapping of what's basically the, the edge of the ditch, uh, it doesn't really feel like contributing much by mapping it. Um, but maybe finding other places like that that are easily accessible would, would be um, good data to provide. Um, and I guess I'll, I'll close out the Joe's last video. And then I kind of thought about this when Margie was talking about some of the, the things that happen, stuff that gets in the water flooding. Um, I don't remember which storm this was, but we're on a, a marsh here in Hampton. And we went out on our pier during one of the nor'easters or something. We saw goldfish. Um, so all, all I can imagine is someone's backyard pond <laughs> flooded <laughs> and, and oh, they escaped. Uh, um, <laughs> imagine that there was probably a nice snack for, for a hare in their return or something after that. But, um, <laughs> yeah, all sorts of things get out in, into the water when it floods. If they didn't explode first. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> from getting into salt water. <laughs> or I guess dehydrate. They would dehydrate. 
Wow. Thank you, Brian. Um, anything else you want to say before I cut you off there? No, I'm All good. Right. Uh, just a big thank you to everyone. I mean, not just the mappers, but you know, everyone who provided this. I put the note in the chat, you know, the, the VIMS forecast being right here on tidal water, I, I make frequent use of. Um, so I'm really glad that it's that it's here. And it's impressive the the accuracy that that Derek showed earlier. Um, Awesome. All right. Well, with that, one giant, huge, as we've all already said, thank you to everybody on the call, everybody who stuck around for the full two hours, um, and to everybody who presented. I'm really grateful to be part of this team and uh, to have been kind of thrown into the crazy, awesome, wild world of mapping and flood mapping and uh, flood resilience in Virginia. So thank you guys for welcoming me into this space. Um, like I said, I'm happy to stay on past eight, but I will leave it open for any final remarks from our presenters and welcome anybody to head on out and enjoy the rest of their evening. Thanks so much, everybody. This is this has been a great a great thing. I, I'm sure that, that when Dave Mayfield was sitting up there in the pilot noodling on this, he had no idea that <laughs> that this would be the result. <laughs> So Take Joe, care. we're looking for people crazy enough to go out there in the rain. So that's the next threshold <laughs> of idiocy we're looking for. We do it. Yeah. I'll do it. <laughs> that's what rain gear is for. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. We really appreciate a lot of our year-round mappers that have helped us collect data in those exact types of conditions in past years. Just always be safe while you're out there. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's real windy and extra slippery when it's that rainy outside. So boots definitely help. But can uh, I ask a procedural question of Joe? Um, do you use the the app for for mapping events, or do you set up your own events? Um. Well, for King Tide, I use the not not for King Tide. I'm sorry for like for, for year round mapping for, for year round mapping. I create. Uh, my own region, and then each month I create an event. So you create so, your own mapping events for your team? Yes. Okay. We'll need uh, to try to capture that process too, Gabby. The, Definitely. Uh, and we're not going to create Catch the King year-round yeah. mapping events. The uh, I, did, I did it just because there wasn't any kind of a year-round uh, region or event. Right. And creating a monthly event made it nice and clean. So all the data for the spring tide that month uh, was contained in one event so I could download it and send it to Derek. Yeah, and I think that process is gonna be good if we target leaders in each mapping area rather than creating our own kind of open open faced monthly mapping things if we can get in with a tide captain who'd be interested in setting those up then we can coordinate it that way rather than us trying to create some umbrella thing but that's that's a discussion for as we get this ball rolling and some emails out there for some teams yeah skip yeah. i don't know what you did for alfonso when he would go out sampling all the time it was he used to do that it's i mean the 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 app was developed to sort of be be managed in a decentralized manner so he was he was setting his own stuff up once um once he had you know the the right level of permission uh and i think that's probably the way to do it is is just create these nodes where people people who are trained and competent to a certain level just go fine do it run and run then it. they have a communication relationship with derek to say we've got data that you can then go into right. the database and, and download. Right. Yeah. Okay. Or, All right. Or, or other data users, uh, transportation engineers, whoever. I mean, that's one of the other things we want to do is, is find, um, especially as we move into rural areas where there isn't the number of gauges and engineers and modelers as there are in Norfolk and Virginia Beach is trying to find out, you know, what the basic data needs are and, and starting to to stoke those local governments with this data. I mean, assuming assuming they can use the, the data layers and, and have somebody on GIS. I mean, some of these areas we go into and there's nobody, 
nobody doing GIS. So that's why we talked to wherever Tom is on your screen. That's why we talked to Tom about possibly using some of his students to do some of that GIS work as a part of their coursework for some of these rural areas. Yeah, I'll follow up that. Uh, there would be interest, I think, in uh, tabulating or analyzing some of the, the disconnected areas that are flooding from uh, the aforementioned like extreme rainfall events where its title is contributing to that uh, by you know infiltrating the stormwater infrastructure. Um, so like even in our, in a colonial place, you know, in Norfolk, uh, we, we see flooding on the interior of the neighborhood, you know, hundreds of feet from the creek because right. it's connected under the ground through the stormwater. So if, uh, if, if folks are interested in mapping that kind of flooding, that could be uh, helpful to the stormwater uh, management uh, folks. Uh, so yeah, the, the, the trick to that is, is, is finding some retired Navy fool who, <laughs> yeah, all the way from captain to, to master chief and on down, who's willing to get up off of their butt, put on a slick or walk out into the rain <laughs> and fire up an event. I mean, theoretically, you know, you can, you can fire up an event on a moment's notice. I mean, I've, I've set up events and, and hmm. like Margie was saying, Alfonso to set up events on his own, I think just, you know, anyway, yeah, yeah, I, that's, that's the thing. I was gonna say when we were doing it earlier, yeah, I would trigger the ones based on storms instead of like Joe is doing every month. Um, but you know, I would rely on you know either the the storm prediction um, if they came out, or you know that guy that lived on the beach, you know, he'd send an email say, "Hey, tide's looking really high today," and I'd go make a you know a three or four day event. And then send an email out and, and say, hey, you know, anyone that can get out a map during the high tide, go for it. So it, it is really, really quick to set up um, and then communicate out that way through the app. It's true. Uh, Karen Jekulich and myself previously were teaching people how to set up their own events. The challenge was is that we kind of discouraged people from doing that because they were accidentally <laughs> setting up their own regions as well. and They were popping up everywhere. Um, so we've never in past training events since like 2017 taught people how to create their own events just for that reason, but it is totally possible as Brian and Joe and others are doing it all the time. <laughs> so if there's an incidental event, you don't necessarily have to wait for us to create an event. If you're familiar with the Sea Rising Solutions website, you can even download your own data and that's how um, several people will send me their data or email me saying they don't know how to get their data and I can usually copy and paste the directions of how to do it. And it's pretty handy. Yeah, we, uh, in, in that 2017 event, we we gave everybody too many permissions. And I remember there was there was one mapper who deleted the entire Norfolk region and all of its data. And it was like, what? <laughs> I have no idea you could do that. <laughs> I wonder. I wonder whether it might uh, be possible to just once a year, in addition to the scheduled event we have, uh, to take advantage of uh, a fairly predictable, you know, one that's predictable within a, a few days, uh, rainy. I'm sorry, sunny day flooding event, uh, uh, and just publicize it with all the folks who have been mapping in the past, uh, you know, uh, and see what kind of participation we have, uh, you know, almost like a bonus event. Yeah, because yeah, those, um, especially those, um, those sunny day events tend to be wind out of the Northeast for a couple of tide cycles. And those are, mm -hmm. I mean, you go to, you know, weather.com and you look at the, forecast out of you can pick those up pretty easily that would be an interesting um exercise i think it's, it also helps because when you have volunteers and mappers you don't want to let them sit there without doing something for a while or else they sort of walk right. away i think it would well, give them the mapper something to do there's also multiple king tide events per year so you yeah. know it's not just like there's the one that's supposedly the highest but usually there's right. two or three more yeah, you know, in fact, it generally, you know, the one we've been picking is not generally the the highest. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, I don't know if it's ever been the highest, you know, but uh, 
that's what I was thinking is that we might be able to actually get even more valuable data uh, if we have people sort of at the ready, you know, uh, to go out with a few days notice. Particularly the sunny day things seem to be, uh, uh, you know, the ones that grab a lot of attention. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Is it safe to say we should all head on out? I think so. I think so. my beer is cold. Yeah. All, all right. right. Well, thank you guys so much. Thanks, everybody. I had a lot of fun. This was awesome. Thank you, Gabby. You did a great later. job. Thanks. Yep. Good job. All right. Talk to everybody soon. Great to see uh, everyone. Good night, Bye. everyone. Bye. Bye.